like to call the meeting to order. Thank you. Just let's try. Okay. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Motion to move to closed session. Do I have a second? As permitted by Section 3-305B of the General Provisions Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, I move that we go into closed session to discuss personnel matters to include bargaining discussion, discipline codes, dress guidelines, administrative items, including MABE committees, legislative committees, legislative 8 to 10 meetings, including legislative day, usually held in February, frequent contact with your legislators, a liaison between Green Street and Green Sheet, I'm sorry, Green Street, the Green Sheet, and your board. Also, budget committee needs volunteers, one or two meetings to review proposed made budget and recommended financial direction. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. We will return at 11 30. Welcome to the Board of Education work session. This is a public meeting that is being videotaped for county citizens to review on QAC TV7, a local cable station. The agenda is available on the information table. During this meeting, we ask that you turn off your cell phones and hold personal conversations outside of the meeting room. Please join us in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For those of you that may not be aware, this past Monday, September 18th, we lost our board, school board president and dear friend, Bishop Arlene Taylor. Bishop Taylor was elected to the Queen Anne's County Public School Board of education in 2014. She was in the third year of her fourth term, serving as president since January 2017. Bishop Taylor was the founder of the Chosen Generation Deliverance Ministries in Graysonville and Youth in Action. She was a person who reached out to those in need, an activist in the Graysonville area and the county for more than 20 years. She was a true companion for her community. Please join me in honoring her member memory with a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Dr. King, would you like to introduce the presentations? Absolutely. Our first presentation is on the FY19 Capital Improvement Plan. Carla, thank you. Good morning, Vice President DiMaggio, members of the board, Dr. King. My name is Carla Pullen. I'm the facilities planner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And I am back with you today to go over our funding requests for fiscal year 2019, the numbers that we will send to the state to request for construction funding. If you'll remember when we spoke two weeks ago at the last meeting, we discussed that we would be asking for two, funding for two capital projects this year. Both of those are chiller projects for Churchill Elementary School and Kent Island High School. I've included for you this morning an updated rendition of the 102.4 form that you have in front of you, which is the summary sheet that both the state and the county look to as guidance for the next six years and what we will be discussing with them in terms of funding requests. Along with the capital projects that we will be requesting from the state, our hope is to solicit the county for funding for projects that were deemed either poor or failures during our facility assessment of all of the buildings uh, in 2016. We, there are just a number of items that we would like to take care of. We know that um, they're in need of some repair, especially for these deficiencies. And so that will be our plan when discussing this with the commissioners over the next few months. 
If you'll take a look at the 102.4 form, this is just rehashing what we talked about last time. Fiscal year 2019, we are looking at the Churchill Elementary School Chiller, the Kent Island Elementary School Chiller. The number for the Kent Island High School Chiller has been raised since we last spoke. Um, this is to allow us to do one of two options with that chiller. We will either replace the componentry as it is, or the second option would be to, the chiller as it currently works, there is an ice tank that is held, uh, ice is held in storage and it helps to maintain a constant temperature for the chilled water. In the second option, we would look at removing that tank and making the chiller a larger size. So we're actually removing a piece of the componentry, which would allow the system to be a little bit more efficient. It is a higher cost, but we're looking at both options right now and we wanna make sure that we have the funding available to go either way. Our maintenance foreman, Jim O'Donnell, is actually meeting right now with one of our manufacturer representatives to get their opinion and feedback on That's that particular that. system. So we have a little bit more of an idea before we submit this at the beginning of October, which way we definitely wanna go. Carla, does it give us a longer, longer life? Mm. Is that Maybe this Not thing. necessarily a longer life, but it's one, one less component that would have to be replaced at the same time. So we believe that not only will be it, but it will be more energy efficient over time, but then as we have to do replacements every 15 to 20 years, we're looking at one less large component that would need to be replaced. In, in theory, the ice storage is a great concept that was out a few years ago, well, 15, 20 years ago, but everything, the stars have to align for everything to work yeah. properly. And I think it would be just one less component that we would have to worry about with that. So and you'll find that with most large buildings that have the ice storage with throughout the country is that's pretty much the scenario of it. So then moving forward into our following years, the number three item that we've listed on this form is the potential to look at a study for replacement of repair or replacement of the Board of Education Office and Anchor Points Academy. There are still of a lot of items that need to be discussed with this particular concept, but we know that we need to start engaging the commissioners in a discussion about a need for repair to this building. Over the next 10 years, we're looking at a $5 million cost in terms of roofing, in terms of HVAC, in terms of plumbing fixtures and things that will need to be replaced. So we wanna start having that conversation with them just to let them know that there are needs coming up, very serious needs for this building and potentially <coughs> looking at a study if the board office would stay in this building or if we would look at something as an alternative. We'll have some roofing replacement projects that are coming up. So we're asking for those in fiscal year 2020 as well we know that we'll have another chiller replacement that will be out there 2021. Ken Island Partial High School roof. This is all of the low slope EPDM roof that will need to be replaced at that time. And then as we discussed last time, we've added the Centerville Middle School full renovation to our list for planning in 2022. If you remember what we had previously been discussing was a limited renovation which meant that we would only be looking at upgrade or replacement of five different systems within the building. In 2019, this school is going to be 40 years old, and it's the only one that hasn't undergone any type of major renovation or addition in that time, and we think this school is ready for that. Unfortunately, with this school, over the years, we have utilized state funding for a number of different items, HVAC, painting, asbestos replacement. Uh, there's a full gamut of items since 2000 that have been repaired or replaced with state money in that school. Therefore, until those repairs are more than 16 years old, the state will deduct that funding from what we're eligible for. So that starts to put a pretty big dent into what we're eligible for. So that is one of the reasons that we've indicated that we think we should put, push this project out a little bit to give us a greater amount of funding. It will also throw our HVAC replacements that have been done over that 16 year threshold. And again, 
were then eligible to replace those systems. The only ones that are large items that will still be outstanding in that time, there was a $179,000 technology modernization that was done in 2012. We at this point don't feel that 16 years is uh, up to date with what current standards are. So that will be something that we'll be having a conversation with the state. It's, it's hard to maintain technology for 16 years. It's hard to maintain technology for five. So we don't feel that uh, that, that full amount should be returned to the state. And then there was a roofing replacement done in 2014. It was uh, approximately a million dollars. So that would also be a large number that potentially would have to be deducted. However, we don't foresee large enrollment growth at that school over the next 10 to 20 years. So we feel that a full renovation could occur potentially under the existing roof, and therefore we wouldn't be uh, disturbing that portion of the building, and therefore we wouldn't have to uh, return that money to them. The last items that we have are the additions to both Queen Anne's High School, Kent Island High School, um, again, there is still a lot of planning that needs to occur, but we know that <coughs> within the next six to ten years, we will have enrollment issues, potentially CTE issues, so we're studying all of those different areas um, in anticipation that something is going to need to happen at both of those schools, and we're just giving the state a heads up with this that, yes, in approximately six years, we are going to be asking for large amounts of funding for these projects. So you're studying, and I see you have plan down there in 2024. So yes. you're not going to study it till 2024? No, the planning approval, we can do our own internal studies, and feasibility studies are not something that's covered by the state, so they will happen sooner than that. The planning approval is something that has to happen before you ask for funding from the state. So in 2022 is when we would go for planning approval and ask for their blessing, so to speak, on those projects. And these funds that it takes to do the studies, does that come out of our capital fund? Or does this come out of? It, it's county funded. So it would be a capital county funded request. So you're saying we'd have feasibility down at about 2022 for those two? I would say probably in the 2020 to 2021 area is where we would want to look at starting to do feasibility. And I think that will give us more um, of an opportunity to look at CTE programs, to look at what enrollment is doing in a few more years, possibly what the plans are for the annex at Mattapique Middle School. That will play heavily into those discussions as well. Because what I've heard is they're filling up Manapeak Middle and they were, I mean their classes up in the ninth grade annex that are eighth grade classes so you know we had the luxury of them there but now right it's increasing I don't know what the projections are for right and at this point we are not projected to go over state rated capacity in the next six years at that school but that's something we're always looking at especially with the sewer project that's happening on Cat Island right now right, right. that's a concern okay thank you yes so our schedule um, today, I, I would love to hear your comments, questions. Um, after we speak today, I would like to send to you electronically the full document that we'll be submitting to the state. It's approximately 75 pages um, for you to take a look at over the next two weeks. We will be asking for your approval of that document, and I'm happy to take questions and comments throughout that time, but we'll be looking for approval at the October 4th meeting so that this can be submitted to the state. On October 11th, we meet with public school construction to discuss the requests, and on October 18th, we meet with the governor and the Board of Public Works to plead our case for these projects as well. That's all I have, if you have any questions. I have a question not related to this. Have we started work on the addition in Grayson? Yes. So just a quick update on the addition. I was actually down there this morning. So there has been a small amount of work happening there now. Whiting Turner has assembled. They have two full-time staff there. There's been a small amount of demolition that's happened in the no. rear. They, they have the security fence up. Um, that is locked down. Uh, and starting on Monday, we will actually begin moving of the earth. We just met about playground relocation and taking down that equipment with our playground reps. So we expect to see a lot more action happening as of next Monday. 
I did have one thing, and from my um, meeting at May the other day, yes. the legislation, they, we met with Mr. Genel, or the one who replaced um, the, the Mr. guy. Mr. Gorrell. Mr. Gorrell. Yes. Right? yes. He gave us a big briefing on, you know, his philosophy. He's new. He's a school construction. You guys have known. But I'm, what I'm wondering is he made a point of that we, the board, needs to attend one of these begathons, you know, we used to, the whole board go, and I think it's important, they said it's important to have representation. We don't have to speak, but to show up. Yeah, so. and actually I was gonna mention that today. So for the, um, the 11th, I think, no, that for the 18th, they're asking for board members, public officials, you know, all of those folks are invited, so I wanted to. We have to a work session that certainly. day, so maybe I we know. do that instead. Perhaps. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure that everybody needs to attend, but if we have oh, you know, at least one representative, I think that probably would suffice. There is approximately five to eight minutes that they give us to do this presentation, so there won't be an opportunity for everybody to talk, but showing um, support for the plan that we present is, is the issue. And there will probably be some questions afterward yes. um, that we may need folks to respond to or... Yes, and a lot of times it's not just school system questions. Sometimes it, it is affiliated with county or other things that are happening in our geographic area. So it's helpful to have representatives there. Okay. Other questions? <laughs> I did have another question, and it's about the fencing at the high school. Is this an appropriate time to ask a question about the sure. fencing that was erected sure. around the back of the high school? Sure. And then was it taken down and moved? I'm a little unclear as to how that transpired. Now, basically, we have some security. You're talking behind Queen County High School. Um, we have some security issues behind there. You have the CTE students that are working in the parking lot. Traffic starts flowing through there throughout the daytime. People were being dropped off, picked up. <coughs> different things were occurring. Um, we met with the um, county fire marshal who stated we had to have a 20-foot gate put in there on each end to meet the fire codes. Um, and was that before it was initially erected or after? When the contractor put it in, he was going off of the old document. Okay. And so the gate is being, it should be within a week. Okay. The poles are put in the correct spot. Right. Um, we right. talked with the um, fire marshal again, um, and he's fine with our plan. Right. I met with uh, one of the officials from... Um, uh, Goodwill Fire Department and we're going to put a knock box on each side of the gate so that they can have um, you know access to it in case they need right. to but it it is a, a major security Yeah, many issue. many years ago it's, there was no traffic allowed back there but over the course of time I did understand that that sort of started happening the more the building got bigger and further away from you know those who could see then the it got a little bit abusive back there and the one inmate that escaped that ran back yes. that way was another yes. key issue playing yes. into yes. this so. yes but we still wanted our kids to be able to egress out there and in they still can emergency. there's uh i believe it's five uh, also uh, egress ways they can get out um along with the standard fire routes i mean it's right. It's, it's put in place. So. Great. And they will start drills on that, including that new. Oh, plan. yeah. Yes. Perfect. Yep. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And so next we have our illustrious curriculum and instruction leaders who will walk us through academic indicator goal one. Um, lots of um, goals and data <coughs> involved with that. So we wanted to be responsive to some requests to um, share data, not only district-wide, but school by school. You'll also receive some data points uh, with regard to our student groups and gaps and what we intend to do about those academic gaps. Good afternoon. Mr. P, anything you want to say? No, just I'll turn it over to my staff. Good afternoon, members of the board and the executive team. For the record, my name is David Brown. I'm the supervisor of accountability. And I am Rob Watkins, supervisor of mathematics. And we will be bringing up various members of the CNI department uh, as we move into their areas of responsibility throughout the presentation.
Uh, today we're going to take a look at uh, our academic indicators. Uh, I'm going to review the academic indicators with you. We're going to take a look at 2017 scores, uh, both from Park as well as from other assessments that, that were given in the county. Uh, we're going to look at the successes on those tests as well as address some additional challenges that we see. So we're going to jump right into the second grade math benchmark assessment. Uh, this was the third year this assessment was given. Uh, our indicator that we shoot for is by the end of the 2021 school year, 90% of our students uh, in grade two will meet or exceed our expectations on the benchmarks in both reading and math. Uh, and this is the, the math benchmark that you're looking at. Uh, System-wide, 88% uh, of our students were successful on that assessment. You can see some of the individual schools have actually exceeded our expectations on that assessment. Park data, we do have indicators for much of our park data. Uh, by 2021, 75% of our students in grades three through eight will be designated as on track for meeting college and career readiness, which is scoring a level, a performance level of four or five on the assessments. Uh, just backing up a little bit on the performance levels, the park assessment is scored at five different levels. Level one is did not meet expectations. Level two is partially met the expectations. Level three is approaching expectations. Level four is met expectations. And level five has, is exceeding expectations. So we predominantly in Queen Anne's County, we're looking at levels four and five for having successful students, meeting and exceeding expectations. Uh, on the screen or on the slide is the three-year trend data for the park assessments in grades three to five. Uh, you can see we, in all three grade levels we, we've shown growth uh, in math. Uh, state average, just to let you see where we rank state average-wise, uh, for fourth grade, I'm sorry, for third grade, we're, the state average is 43%. Queen Anne's County had a 58.1. State average for fourth grade is 37.4. Queen Anne's was 48.9. And the state average for grade five is 35.5, <coughs> with Queen Anne's coming in at 48.9. And this is just a breakdown of individual schools. Uh, how they did on the park test grades three through five. So you're looking at, at band level data for the park assessments. Uh, and again, just to let you know where we ranked in the state. In third grade math, we were fifth in the state, second on the Eastern Shore. Fourth grade math, we were fifth in the state, number one on the Eastern Shore. And fifth grade math, we were fourth in the state, and number one on the Eastern Shore. Who was number one and the one that we were number two? Sorry, uh, the first one. <laughs> Say that three times fast. <laughs> the first, the first one. Uh, grade shore. three. Who was first grade on the Eastern Shore? Three was uh, Worcester. I'll be darned. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that, I'm no. wrong. That was math. That yellow grade three. Math grade three was Carol. Uh, no, Worcester beat us on the shore. And we were two. Okay. Interesting. <coughs> You said Worcester? Worcester. Okay. Just grade three. We were first and fourth and fifth. Correct. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> this chart can be a little bit confusing. It's trying to show two things. Uh, the orange bars there shows you the size of the population, of the subgroup population. The blue bar shows the percentage of students and, and how they were scoring. Uh, so it's a good way of looking at gap. The gap would be the difference between the, the all student level, that solid blue line, and the top of the bar for each of the subgroups. 
So this is no surprise to Queen Anne's County. We're looking at the same gaps that we've been looking at in the past. Our biggest areas, you know, the, with population and gap would be our African American population, our free and reduced meals, and our special education. You know, these are areas that we've looked at in the past as having gaps. And, and as we go through these slides at the various grade bands, you'll see the same gaps throughout. Interesting that Title I is not that far down <coughs> from the whole Title I program. Yes, Title I, yeah. Title I. That surprises me. Yeah, we're doing pretty good on the Title I as far as the gap there. Uh, math, grades six through eight. Again, you can see where we fall. This is a three year trend. Uh, did not have a lot of growth in, in sixth grade uh, last year, but the other grade levels did show some growth. Uh, grade eight, if you look at the grade eight math on its own, we did not have growth there. We actually went back just a little bit there. But when you look at eighth grade math, and, and you can notice there's three things that have eighth grade math labeled. There is an eighth grade math test, which is the students who are in regular eighth grade math take in part. Then there is the algebra one test, which is the high school algebra test for the advanced students in eighth grade. They take that assessment. So it, what you're seeing in those three things labeled eighth grade, <coughs> the eighth grade math test is the first one. The next one is the eighth grade algebra test, just pulling out and looking at the students who took eighth grade algebra. And then the last one that says all eighth grade gives you an idea how our eighth grade did overall, not separating it into the two content areas or the two course areas. So overall in eighth grade, we did have some good significant growth. <coughs> eighth grade seems to be a problem area in the state of Maryland. The, the state of Maryland in general saw a 5% reduction in the number of students who achieved a 4 or 5 ac across the state. We saw a much lesser reduction on that. Um, we were also looking at our strategies to ensure that we're maximizing the number of kids who, who have the opportunity to take eighth grade algebra one. So we think that uh, in the, the strategies we put in place are going to continue to help us uh, grow our middle school math program. And again, looking at the individual school data and our, our ranking. Uh, and again, this school data is when we're including the math on here for, for middle school math. It is not including those algebra students, those high flyers <coughs> in the this, this scoring. Uh, but where we ranked in the state and on the shore, sixth grade math, we were third in the state, first on the shore. Seventh grade math, we were fifth in the state and third on the shore. And eighth grade math, we were fifth in the state and third on the shore. And again, the gap data, we're looking at the same, same subgroup populations that we need to concentrate on still. Park Algebra 1, now this, this is middle and high school data. It's the Park Algebra 1 scores. Uh, again, we've increased for the third year in a row. Uh, state average on this test was a 36.5. Queen Anne's County uh, average or scores were 56.2 percent of levels four and five. Uh, keep in mind as we're looking at this data that this is a graduation requirement uh, passing this assessment uh, with and the, the current passing score is a 725, which is a level three. So the data we just looked at, that 56% was four and fives. If you look at three, that would include the yellow band as well as the green band in that slide. So that is currently 81.9% of last year's test takers met the graduation requirement. So three is a graduation requirement that they made three? Currently, for, for last year's test takers, they needed to score three, which is a, a score of 725 or better. To go up to ninth grade? Two. To, to graduate. graduate. To, to graduate 
to meet the Maryland graduation requirement. I know that, but eighth graders aren't worried about. Gra what do you? I don't know what you're saying. Sorry. Well, this is okay. when it, this is for the algebra one. <coughs> So for period. whatever so grade they, they, could, they took it. They could have been in the 8th grade when they took it, or they may have taken it even in 10th or 11th grade last year. Their requirement to graduate is a 725 on that test. Somewhere between 8th and graduation. Somewhere between 8th grade and So this does year. show Algebra 1, then? This is all Algebra 1. This is just oh, the Algebra 1 algebra. data. Okay, sorry. Oh, there it is. I see. All right. Yeah, this is just sorry. Algebra 1. We, we pulled out the 8th grade math. Okay. So 81% you know, of our students, 82%. <coughs> met their graduation <laughs> requirement, taking it for the first time. Again, subgroups, same subgroups we're looking at. Uh, African American population, special ed and farms. Uh, actually, the farms did fairly well on the Algebra 1, uh, at least as far as closing the gap a little bit there. In Algebra 1, we have a specific program that, that, that addresses students who may be struggling up to a year behind in Algebra 1, oh, excuse me, between one and three years behind. The program is called Intensified Algebra. This year is our third year that we're running that program at Queen Anne's and Ken Island High School. And I'm happy to report we saw 42% 40, of the students that we identified as potentially struggling kids passed with a three or better in, in Algebra 1 last year. Um, that's consistent with how we saw it in the years past as well. The, the program is definitely yielding results and it's providing them the resource that they need in order to be successful in Algebra 1 and to build upon that knowledge. Math, what worked? Mr. Watkins. Boy, all, all sorts of things worked. So, so last year we, we went after the initiative of putting all of our elementary assessment data into our data collection system Unify. So we, that was a success. We were able to get all of the unit assessments, so, so between six and eight assessments per grade level were dumped by standard into the data platform, which gave the, the, the leadership teams, the specialists and the teachers the tools to really understand how students are performing in mathematics. Um, our, our specialist team w was very busy last year and in previous years and will be this year. And they, they are our curriculum writing lead. So each of my, my elementary and middle school math specialists are assigned a grade level. A couple of them have two specialists. And they lead a group of teachers in examining the data, rewriting and reexamining uh, the resources we're using in our curriculum and making sure that we have high standard alignment inside of each of our curricular documents. They also serve as our primary interventionists at the school, servicing the students who struggle in math. And they, are, are, uh, they were trained last year in instructional coaching. So they go in and provide coaching to teachers to help them um, become better teachers. Um, last year, we piloted the Do the Math program, an intervention targeting uh, specific gaps in mathematics at Southerville, uh, Kennard, and Southerville Middle School. Um, we, this year, we will be expanding that pilot to all elementary schools, so we are able to put a evidence-based, research-based program in, in, in practice at all of our schools, and that program is getting up and running right now. Um, it, it's very exciting because we're, we're, we're now starting to get to a place where we're using the same intervention strategies across the board and we're able to build upon those successes to kind of strengthen our program. Uh, Math 180 is an intervention program we're using at, at middle schools. Last year was our third year we used it and we're, we're, still, we're seeing great gains in the students who are enrolled in that program to help them support uh, the gaps in their mathematical understanding. Agile Minds, and we talked about intensified algebra as our primary resource, and the, the park aligned items in the assessment bank help us to make sure that we're offering rigorous uh, curricular materials and rigorous assessments to our, to our students. And I, I just, I, I can't leave this part without highlighting the work that over 50 people did this summer to re, re, reinvent, rewrite, and re-examine our math curriculum from, from kindergarten through Algebra 2. Uh, if you really saw Kennard, Kennard was firing off in, at the end of June last year, working very hard to, to, to add some stuff to our, to our arsenal. We can talk about what we are still working on, and there, here we are with a, with a number of things we're still working on. Um, we, we added to the central collection of our assessment data to, in, to middle school and high school this year. So we examined uh, how successful that examination of data was in elementary school and we, we replicated it at high school. So we basically aligned our assessment uh, program to be, to be housed on Unify. So many more opportunities for students to take online assessments as opposed to paper pencil assessments in alignment with what Park is expecting. We created um, a constructive response pieces, so we, we create some items for each grade level to ensure that kids are engaged in high level and rigorous tasks. 
uh, we created a series of park mini assessments that are available for teachers to use uh, with their students. They would take them directly online and the data gets tracked in Unify. So it allows the teachers to do a little bit more insight with how students are, are predicted to perform on park. And then when they identify areas of need, they're able to address them individually so that we can help the students become successful there. Uh, the last piece I'll highlight is the professional learning. So we continue to target the, the, the strategies in modeling and reasoning, reasoning to support those levels of, of, of instruction in mathematics. We, we know that the root procedural skills are necessary for kids to be successful. Uh, the places where we think we can create gains is helping students become better mathematical thinkers and more proficient problem solvers. So we continue to add uh, strategies to our teachers' arsenals in order to be successful there. Ask yes, Mrs. McGowan to come up so she can help address the special ed while she's coming up here. I did forget to mention where Algebra 1 fell within the state in the Eastern Shore. Uh, our Algebra 1 students were fourth in the state and number one on the Eastern Shore. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Diane McGowan. I'm the supervisor for special education. The first slide that you are looking at represents the percent of students with IEPs scoring at a level four or five compared to the state average on park. Uh, as you can see that among, um, we, we were able to score above the state average in grades three, four, six, and eight, and also with our algebra one and algebra two testing. Among our Eastern Shore districts, Queen Anne County uh, was ranked first for grade six and also for Algebra one and Algebra two. And in those same grades, uh, we were, came in third overall in the state with those scores. The next slide represents our uh, scores for the multi-state al alternate assessment. This is an assessment designed to assess the English language arts and mathematics skills <coughs> of our students that are considered to be significantly cognitively impaired. IEP teams determine whether or not they are going to participate in that alternate assessment uh, based on eligibility criteria that has been developed by the state. It is given in grades three through eight and also in grade 11. The design of the test is an online format that is approximately 30 test questions that target about 10 prioritized contents per grade level in both English language arts and math. This represents a small number of students that actually participate in this each year. Um, last year uh, in grades six we had 10 students, in grade seven we had eight students, and in the remaining grades we had four or less students participating. Uh, all told too we have eight teachers that actually implement this assessment uh, each year. And you can see in grades three, four, and eight, we were able to have average student scores that were above the state average. Um, within this system, this is a newer assessment, so they have not kind of issued a ranking system yet. So we showed you the data compared to our average student scores to the average state score. Some of the initiatives for students with IEPs that are working and that we are continuing. Uh, we are continuing to participate with MSDE as part of the state systemic improvement plan to increase proficiency in math performance for students with disabilities in grades three through five. Through this collaborative initiative, not only with the state, but with my office and with our Office of Mathematics, um, we are looking at some key approaches, such as selection of evidence-based math interventions. This is how we were able to phase in the Do the Math project last year and then expand the project this year through our work with the CISIP grant and then through special education grant funds. Um, this also allows us to develop our knowledge and use of systems coaching by developing not only our knowledge but that of our elementary and middle school math specialists. Um, and finally, initiatives looking at improving high quality tier one instruction that we are then delivering to our elementary teachers. We're also looking at our 
special education teachers' ability to improve IEP writing, making sure that we are aligning to the standards so that we are developing higher and more rigorous content standards and expectations for all of our students, um, including interpreting specifically to what that means for that individual student. Um, and then lastly, enhancing our special education teachers and related service providers' understanding of what those standards mean um, and how to really look at that in developing rigorous standards that meet individual students. Um, we're providing opportunities for them to attend content PD um, and providing resources that are aligned to standards, um, such as we use special education funds to purchase a program called Goal Book that is aligned to standards um, and embeds research-based frameworks such as universal design for learning into the different resources that are available to teachers as well. Any questions? Uh, this would be a great time to ask any questions about math while we have math or, or special ed math while we have both of our content people here. I'm going to ask the first question and answer it myself. Because um, <laughs> Diane mentioned Algebra 2, and, and I have not showed you any data on Algebra 2. So why I haven't done that? Uh, we do not test all of our students in Algebra 2. We don't, even students as they complete Algebra 2, we do not test them in Algebra 2. We use that as as a college and career readiness assessment. But if our students, when they complete Algebra 2, have already shown us through one other assessment that they are college and career ready, we don't retest them in Algebra 2. Uh, and it's very much like that across the state. So you look at some counties and they may only test 30 kids in Algebra 2. So trying to do a statewide comparison of data, even one year to another within our own county, it just doesn't give us really good data to look at and compare. So that's why there is no Algebra 2. And you're going to find the same when we get to ELA. We don't score ELA 11 you know, compared to data as well. So other questions you might have for, for Mr. Watkins or Mrs. McGowan? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If not, we'll move on to ELA. <coughs> Like to introduce yourself. We will. So, good afternoon, um, President DiMaggio, board members, Dr. Kane, and executive team. My name is Susan Walbert. I am the supervisor of early learning, Title I, EL, and migrant education. I'm Bridget Passan, ELA supervisor, grades 3 through 12. Okay, as we look at the ELA data, again, our first benchmark or our first uh, indicator deals with the grade 2 benchmark. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to the math benchmark. We are looking at how the students are doing in the end of the year grade two benchmark for reading. And the data is presented there system-wide. 69.2% uh, of our students were successful in that assessment last year. That was the first year we have given that assessment. It was a brand new assessment last year, so we have no trend data on that. Uh, but again, you can see some of the schools are already closing in on that 90% goal that we have. <clears throat> and as we move into the park elementary grade bands, uh, you can see again the grade three scores trend for the past three years, grade four and grade five scores trend for the past three years. Uh, last year in grade three, we had 44.9% of our students that were proficient or, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using old terminology, uh, that exceeded or met the requirements. Uh, the state average was 39.8 uh, for grade three. And in grade four, we had 53.2, scoring a four or a five. State average was 41.9. And in fifth grade, we had 50.3 with a state average of 41.4. Uh, a couple of things the, the, the data is looking up there. You can see we're kind of we're kind of flatlined in grade five. Uh, so we, we will be you know, looking at grade five. And 
Let's move on to our individual schools. And again, you can see how the individual school just did for the grade band of three to five. State ranking in ELA in the elementary schools, we were number ninth in the state for grade three. That is the lowest we, we actually scored against the state in any assessment. But we were second on the Eastern Shore. Uh, in, in grade four, we were fifth in the state and number two on the shore. And in grade five, we were eighth in the state and number three on the Eastern Shore. Uh, subgroup data. Again, same subgroups we're looking at, African-American population, uh, free and reduced, and special ed. Moving up to grades six and eight, uh, six through eight. In grade six, the state average was 38.4. Our students scored a 54.1. In grade seven, the state average was 43.1%. We were at 69%. And in grade eight, the state average was 38.9 and we were at 58.9%. And again, you can see steady growth uh, in each of those three grade levels over the past three years. ELA, six to eight by school and this is again where you will see a state ranking and eastern shore ranking you don't get much better than this <laughs> we were ranked number one in the state for grades six seven and eight and so that makes us number one on the eastern shore also for six seven and eight for ela Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot to celebrate mm -hmm. <clears throat> but that doesn't disguise the fact that we still have work to do with our subgroups. Jumping to ELA 10, uh, an, another good year for, for our 10th grade English. You can see the growth over the three years for, the, for that test. Last year, we scored a 66.5% of our students, performance levels four and five. State average was 49.3%. And again, that's only looking at levels four and five. <clears throat> ELA 10 is another graduation requirement. It's, it's, it's scoring a 725 was the last year's minimum score in order to be considered meeting the graduation requirement. So again, that is levels three, four, and five. So when you look at those charts, add the yellow band to that as well. So that, again, that's 81.6% of our students that took the test last year met the graduation requirement on a, as a first time test taker. Uh, that put us at number two in the state and number one on the Eastern Shore. Super. Again, Subgroup, subgroup, subgroup. <clears throat> gap, gap, gap. Yeah. Let these fine ladies address what worked. Start from the elementary? We can start from the elementary. Um, so the slide that Dave shared with you about the ELA benchmark, that um, particular assessment was just developed by our reading specialist. They use the Wonders platform, which is the um, tool that we use to, to deliver our standards in the early grades. Um, and we are, we obviously, you know, they built that upon the assessments that Wonders puts out there that are very closely aligned to park assessments. So the, so the second graders get a, a chance to, to see that. So, so we're pretty happy with that. Also adding on to elementary, Susan and I are both new to the elementary program, but in working with teachers, they have uh, 
been incredibly focused as they should be on writing. But we're also going to take a closer look looking using all these amazing wonders resources that we're familiarizing ourselves with to drill down on reading and reading standards um, and to make that a focus as well. So we're kind of balancing the reading and writing piece um, to see if we can move, um, move our students to higher achievement, move those numbers on the shore and in the state up for certain. One other thing about um, the early learning, our, um, this will be the first year that Queens <coughs> County will have kindergarten readiness assessment data for all of our students. Last year it was, it was a uh, random sampling. This year every student will have that. So we'll be able to dive into that data very quickly and see um, what we can do for those students who are not ready for kindergarten. What we Dave, can I just talk about middle and high school? Oh, yes, oh, the, I'm sorry. the things we did that worked there. Yep. Um, in the middle school, we met those teachers in October for their countywide PD day. And the specialists in the middle schools had requested countywide PD on higher level questioning uh, as well as active reading. So we worked to build sessions around those needs. So those were provided to teachers over the course of three hours. Our specialists led the sessions, and grade levels moved among those specialists to receive. Uh, training on dialectical journaling, um, how to draft a lesson in a graphic organizer using higher level questioning, um, and active reading strategies aligned with equ equitable instruction. So we were able to greet them early on, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the year in our reading specialist meetings. We were able to look at the reports on the Unify platform and really deep dive the data um, to inform instruction. And we particularly focused on the reading standards to do that. So we saw some growth there. We provided close reading um, that was initially provided by MSDE in October, and then we made sure that each of the middle schools got that close reading professional development sometime between January and March. And the specialists also worked to share their action plans for preparing for PARC. What else did we need to do um, as we approached the May test date to make sure our students were comfortable to take it on the computer, were comfortable being timed? Um, in addition to having the reading and writing skills to meet that. So there were a lot of different things going on on a daily basis in our middle schools that we worked to start from early October. Our longest running initiative in the high school was the creation and implementation of a pilot unit. <coughs> Teams at the high schools um, wanted more information on how to teach reading informational text that aligned with the research task, <coughs> excuse me, on PARC. So those teachers took their own time and their own planning um, on a bi-weekly basis um, and I would go out to the schools and we would work together to draft that unit and they implemented that unit from late March up until the test date and we certainly they built in assessments within that unit three of them so they could constantly be gauging and monitoring their students and adjusting that unit accordingly um, our, our high schools have spent a um, great amount of time on literary analysis but adding in that uh, research simulation unit um, certainly helped or so so the scores uh, indicate which was exciting so we worked to build on that this summer as well for our English 10 teams um, in professional development in November <clears throat> we did a range finding activity where we used the park writing and the park rubric to make sure all our school our high school teachers um, had the same approach when they use the park rubric for scoring um, so that was really helpful there and happened early in the year so they were able to use it the rest of second semester and all of third semester. So that's what we're seeing that worked from an ELA perspective. Okay, what we're still working on? Um, as far as what we're still working on, obviously I, I mentioned the KRA data, that, that's, it's really, um, we're excited about that data. Our, our, our kindergarten teachers will be able to group <coughs> students based on their needs, and then we'll also be able to to look out into the community to find out where these um, students were prior to coming in. Were they our pre-K students? Were, is our pre-K program um, making our students ready for kindergarten? And are some of the other programs in the county, are they helping to make our, and we're going to reach out to those, um, those particular places once we get that data in so that we can get our kids ready. Grades 6 through 10, all of our assessments pre, mid, and a post are now on the Unify platform. So our students will be testing on computers and will be able to have real-time access to that data to inform instruction and move it along. So we're excited to move from paper pencil to an online platform. Um, we'll use that data in our specialist and chairs meetings monthly. Curriculum writing, we had 27 ELA teachers from across the county. So every sixth, uh, every middle and high school was represented. Um, and there was a special educator, at least one on each team, to help create course at a glance documents. So they include at least two units. 
um, with literary analysis in one unit and research simulation in the other unit. Um, well scaffolded resources built in, so we're excited to have those in grades 6 through 10. Um, and the 11th and 12th grade worked to include units that helped meet the CCR graduation requirement. So we did a lot of hard work this summer that we're looking to build on um, this year and next summer as well. Uh, equitable instruction and more access and development on active reading strategies um, are key goals for, for both of us at, and at all levels um, to move along ELA instruction. So across the board, we talk about, um, or we look at our data and we see that our issue is not necessarily all student performance, but it falls in our student groups, those gaps. Yes. So, and you did speak about in, um, implementing those equitable instructional practices, just for the purpose of those folks who don't know what that means. Could you give us a little background on what that looks like in the classroom? Certainly. So in making sure that all students get what they need, um, we are looking to, in the high school setting, not go back to how it was in elementary school, but to look at more grouping our students appropriately. So there may be students who, in a close reading uh, activity, are ready to move on and try those close reading strategies by their self. There may, those, there may be those students who are just about to hit um, full achievement, but they need one more chunk of text or one more go at it with the teacher giving them feedback before they try a formative assessment for the day on their own. And then there may be those students who are sur surpassing their peers in the school, so they're ready to move on. And in times, what I really see to work is students working with students, so we might move those um, higher performing students to work with their, with their peers in groups. Um, but what happens when you, when you group students and meet them where they are is by the end of that lesson, every student has met the goal. In some cases, they've been enriched. In some cases, you just got them to fulfilling it. So I think collaborative work, but also grouping our students is one of those strategies that we can use. And Dr. Kane, just to add on that, in the, the unit that we piloted, um, we focused on farms, African American and uh, EL students in that work. So when we were tracking our, our mini assessments, we were looking at those subgroups and watching what we could do for all our students, but for those subgroups as well. And we, we saw the gaps close um, in uh, our African American students and our farm <coughs> students. We, we still have work to do that we need with our EL and special ed, but we saw, we saw some work there and in really getting the teachers to look at how that data should be informing their instruction. Okay. And, and we can get into uh, more detail later because I'm sure that there are um, strategies that we can share across grade levels. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. When you say grouping, do you mean grouping in a classroom all three areas, the lower level, middle level, upper level, yes. not grouping everyone in one room? Exactly. Great. So it's having and all the... Yeah. All, yep. Mm -hmm. And it's it's ever changing. It mm -hmm. could be it could be based on skills. So a, a certain skill that a child might be lacking on, mm -hmm. their grouping the groupings and and the uh, guided reading would change right. for the for the students' well, needs. Well, that's why the peer help is so important and available because you have those levels. Agreed. As well as meeting all modalities of learning. I mean, there are some students who are more audio than they are visual, and so they work better in a seminar sure. or perform better in a seminar with sure. speaking and listening than they might in writing um, a dialectal journal or something to that end. So it's in marrying all these important strategies and really closing our gaps. Yep. Agreed. Great. Going back, going back to our little people because we, we that, that's our foundation. But getting books in their hands, yep. um, uh, you know, a lot of our students uh, uh, that. It, it, you know, what one student might have at home is not what another student has. So we need to do a better job at reaching out to those um, families prior to school to make sure that they have a nice library at home as well. Excellent. I have a question um, for you, Greg, too. Sure. One of the um, curriculum audit things um, had, had to do with analyzing our interventions. And is this a follow-on to that? You know, if the intervention doesn't work, we were going to get rid of it, that kind of thing. I am so glad you brought that up because <laughs> one of the first tasks that, um, that Susan and I are looking at and that we spoke with Dr. Kane and Mr. Pluski about is doing more or less of an audit on our interventions, okay. triangulating data, seeing what is working for our students and what is in, and making recommendations accordingly for the 1819 school year. Um, that was a piece um, that admittedly was a second priority last year as I was 
you know, making my way into the county and learning what we needed from a curricular standpoint, but the interventions are imperative, and we're going to work to get a grasp on that before January. We'd be happy to come back with you and share our findings, um, and then use that to make recommendations um, from a budget perspective, and most importantly, from a student's uh, uh, perspective for next year. Right, because I see that as a, a big gap, gap closer instead of you know, using something that doesn't work for a long period. Right. Well, monitoring what interventions we have and then how are we monitoring the students when they're in the interventions. Exactly. Okay. And, and you, uh, it's a great point, Captain Kelly. Thank you for bringing that up. The other thing that you'll see in, uh, I believe, November, our Innovation Center teams that are working on the audit, our Team 5 has that as their priority. So even though that lives in a content area, they're the group that's kind of overseeing that work. So we'll that's one of the key their key priorities for 17 and 18 as we sat down with Dr. Kane and reprioritized the work of all five of those teams so you'll get you'll get a great update in November on where they are in that work okay great thank cool. you <laughs> Mr. Vigal is going to come up and address our students with special needs okay okay So you're looking at our Park ELA scores for students with disabilities. Again, you're seeing the percent of students with IEPs scoring um, at the level four or five compared to the state average. In grades three, four, six, seven, eight, and 11, our students with IEPs are scoring above the state average. Among our Eastern Shore districts, students in grades four, six, seven, and 8 and 11 ranked second among our Eastern Shore districts and uh, we scored we ranked second across the state in grades 7 and 8. Looking at our multi-state assessment scores for ELA, we were able to score above the state average for grades 3, 4, and 11. Um, we scored at the state average for grade 8. Uh, one of the reasons we have let, uh, scored below average in grades five, six, and seven is that there's an increased emphasis with this assessment on the writing expectations for our students, even with significant cognitive disabilities. Um, and so you'll see in the next slide that um, one of our initiatives is to actually work on improving our teachers' ability to increase the writing expectations and the rigor um, for students with significant co cognitive disabilities. Um, if you look down at the last bullet, you'll see providing resources um, to make the standards accessible to students taking our multi-state alternative assessment through things like Unique Learning Curriculum, which is an online and interactive curriculum that's based on the standards. Um, it's interactive, it's online, there's um, differentiated um, components for it for the students that are at different communication levels. Um, and it's a curriculum that's available pre-K through the transition, so for students that are in our 18 to 21 age group. Uh, we also purchased through some grant funds a program called Ut Retopia, which is a comprehensive reading curriculum for our middle and high school students with significant cognitive dis disabilities. It brings firsthand experiential learning to our students and focuses not only on English language arts, but also the social studies and science contents as well. And then this year, we are also in our focus to improve our writing expectations. We were able to purchase, again, through grant funds, the first author writing curriculum, which is the first and only curriculum of its kind designed for students with significant cognitive disabilities. It focuses on improving the quality of writing instruction uh, for, all for all of our students. Uh, it is based on research and provides those tools to be able to teach our students those more complex needs and to be able to measure progress as well. Um, so having that student outcome data to know whether or not they're making progress. And lastly, working with Maryland State Department of Education and providing our teachers uh, 
professional development in the area of communicative competence, which that's defined as the ability to understand and use language effectively to communicate both in authentic social as well as school environments. So being able to communicate their wants and needs as well as what they know academically. And this is for all students who include even our nonverbal students to verbal students. So it provides resources for looking at that um, continuum of communication measures from an eye gaze device to um, you know text to speech and giving figuring out what's going to work for those students and how can we get that information across again continuing to work similarly to math on IEP writing and training our teachers on understanding the standards um, and lastly as kind of was addressed in that last question was being able to review and refine our capacity to support the implementation of evidence-based practices so working again collaboratively with our curricular offices um, to look at our intervention <coughs> effectiveness um, through student outcomes as, was, as well as fidelity checks. And then um, I am in charge of uh, Innovation Center 5, so it kind of goes along with that work as well. For the special needs group, do we do the same search for gaps? in the African American community, the reduced lunch community, as we do in the larger guidelines that include the special needs children? We, do we look for those same gaps in that group? We have we have not hist historically because it's the a much smaller population. It, it, it is. Um, and typically the data that we get doesn't break down our subgroup into, into further subgroups. Okay. It will disaggregate it typically uh, male versus female, but not into those further mm -hmm. subcategories. Okay. Okay. As you said, once we start doing subgroups of subgroups, right. we start talking about one or two students. Right. It's hard to get. Right. I, I have a question, a couple of general. The, the IEP writing, you talked about it, um, improving that for significantly cut. How about every IEP? It, it, it is. I, it's the general sta it statement. It is for it is for all teachers, oh, all special education teachers, as well as our related service providers. Again, what is that? How do we take that standard that is out there for all students and make it accessible to our students with disabilities? So figuring out what they need, what their specially designed instruction is to help bridge them closer to achieving that grade level standard. Okay. For the curriculum folks, um, I've been receiving an enormous amount of feedback from uh, a lot from parents of students going into ninth grade, because that's where I am, and um, of my son. Writing is, is a, a big, big weakness, so I'm just glad that it looks like the curriculum, even at the state level, is coming down as we need to do more of, of that. And I noticed in your IEP for Studio LA, the first author writing curriculum, is that some kind of a program that would work with general ed students as well, or is it unique to? It is unique to st students with significant cognitive disabilities. That's kind of where the research was because that was a piece that was lacking um, in, in kind of curriculum availability. Are there other initiatives that you, like your office is working on for writing, improving writing? Yes. writing requirements, standards, all that. Um. So the two units that are in each grade level right now have mastery assessment that is a writing assessment. And it includes assessing the reading skills. So it'll be two passages that students haven't been studying throughout the unit, but will have to use the reading skills. And then it's a park formatted writing prompt. What we want to build in there is a writer's workshop. So the work is the kind of the next steps that we've put in resources that we're all using now as best practices. A formal writer's workshop um, is in the works for next summer when we have more time and we have student samplers and exemplar responses to design those lessons. But writer's workshops are what's encouraged between students' first draft in class to the final product that they submit. So more of a look at that from rough draft to finished polished product. Um, is being encouraged in, in all our classes. And as we go through this curriculum writing process over the course of the next three to five years, there'll be a certain number that's required from each teacher so that we can take the student composition folder, whether it's electronic um, or an actual manila folder, and be able to open that and see that body of evidence, see that they're moving from, rough, from outlining to brainstorming to rough draft, et cetera, and using the information in the unit to do that. 
So as I said, writing, reading is taking a focus this year because writing has been get, got, getting a lot of attention in terms of assessment, but I'm not sure to what end in instruction. So we're working to balance that as well in the units that we built and where we plan to take these units throughout the year and next summer. So the writing assessment though with the computerized park assessment, how do, they actually get a piece of paper and that is analyzed paper written responses or is it done again on the computer? For what we wrote for curriculum, for Queen Anne's curriculum? For, for oh. ARC. Which is ARC is on the computer ARC is all, and yes, ARC county all assessments are on the computer. So even the writing they have to type Yes, yeah. they type in a okay. text box that extends. And Captain Kelly, unfortunately, too, from an evidence-based, research-based intervention perspective for at all, any and all students other than this first <coughs> author curriculum, there's nothing on the market that falls into that category. It's something that at the state level and my colleagues across the state continue to ask for and seek and still has not been, um, has not been developed yet. So it's still the teacher? Yes. The teacher. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions for our English and reading? Thank you. Thank you. And so we're about three quarters of the way finished with our goal one. So I want to poll and see how you're doing. Do you want to break for lunch or do you want to continue to move on? Nobody wants to say. Do you want us to continue? Or do you want to break? Whatever we can do it either way. Else wants to do it again. We'll break. We'll take okay. a break. Okay. Uh, welcome back to the uh, second half of the open meeting, and we'll turn it over to Dr. King. So we will continue with our presentation for um, indicator goal one for our academic progress. And I believe we're going to continue with a career college and career readiness data. Yes, Dr. Kane. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to the break, we, we pretty well finished up the park data. Uh, the CCR indicator is based primarily on uh, the College and Career Readiness Act of 2013 that was passed by the state legislature, requiring our high school juniors to be college and career ready uh, by the end of their <coughs> junior year. So we track that data through this indicator. Uh, our goal is that 75% of our juniors will be designated as college and career readiness. And the measurements of that are the park assessments as well as uh, <coughs> park level two assessments. That would be the, the algebra two and park test and the English 11 park test. And then also the SAT, the ACT, the IB, which we generally don't use in this county, AP exams, or AccuPlacer. So the, the slide that's currently on the screen is two years worth of data. Uh, the first three columns on the left is from the previous year, the 15-16 school year. And we're looking at students that are college and career ready in math or in ELA and then both math and ELA and for that year 52.8 percent of our juniors uh, were considered or designated as college and career ready and then you can see by subgroup percentages of the subgroups that were also designated as college and career ready in either math ELA or both I don't understand what I'm looking at here. Sorry. Is there a year on each of these? Uh, the, the left side is the 2016-17, uh, I'm sorry, the 2015-16 data. On the right side is 16-17 data. So we have a lot less on the right side? So we actually dropped down. Yeah. Okay. In, in the second year. We were down by, <coughs> by uh, about 2%. The third year? Third year, we don't have th th third year data. This is just two years worth of data. The first column on the left is math, oh, okay. and then ELA, I and then I both. See, sorry. So the both <laughs> drops because you had to have an ELA and a math to be considered college career ready in both. 
and then you can see by our subgroups. Yeah, yeah. Some disturbing zero, data zero, six, 15, 16, at the end of their junior like year yeah. last yeah. year, I, I only 4.4 percent of our special <coughs> education students were considered college and career ready. 23 percent of our farm students and 9.4 percent of our African American students are, are being designated as college and career ready by the end of their junior year. I, I have a question. So this doesn't have anything to do with graduation? No. This okay. College of Career Readiness has nothing to do with graduation. Okay. Right. It's just a Maryland standard. This is, this is a Maryland reporting requirement. Okay. It, it's very interesting because we are required to, to test the students and we are required, if they are not college and career ready by the end of their junior year, then we must provide a transition module or course in their senior year and then retest them in their senior year. But whether or not they're college and career ready does not affect graduation at all. So if they're not done their senior year, if it doesn't work, it doesn't matter. It's just data. It's just data. It's, it's a reporting. Okay. Eventually, we suspect this will be part of the accountability mod model that Maryland will be using. <coughs> Uh, the next slide is the senior year. We have set a goal for ourselves that 90% of our seniors will be designated as college and career ready. And again, this all started, you know, last year's seniors were the first group of students that fell under this, this act. So it's the, the first class we have data on. So you can see that 55.8% uh, of our seniors were designated as college and career ready in both ELA and math. That would be 66% were designated in math, 63 were in ELA, <coughs> but the number or the percentage that were both was 58%. And again, if you start looking at subgroups, uh, our African American population, 25%, 3.8% of our special ed students, and 28.7% of our farm students. <coughs> Interesting is our Hispanics are good in math, right? <laughs> like small, again, you're number. looking at a small population. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, like yeah, the ones we have are, are good in math, yes. Huge number. But again, it's, it okay. can be offset by the size of the population. I got so, thank you. I was going to ask if you could talk just a little bit about what might create what? these types of fluctuations and the year of graduation, the year that the student is, the population size at that grade level versus right. and, the assessment. And when we start talking about some of our take. subgroups, the size of the subgroup may fluctuate a great deal between one year and the next year. So while you may see a huge change in percentages, you may only be talking one or two students difference in, in actual numbers. Uh, but again, this is evidence that we do need to encourage our farms, our special ed, <clears throat> our African American population to start getting involved in more rigorous coursework because the more rigorous coursework feeds right into this data. The student, you know, AP tests is part of this. Can uh, I ask a question then? Yes. If, if we're measuring AP, why are we measuring dual enrollment? We are. Yes, yes. dual enrollment part of also it? counts as this part is, of this. this, well. this when we, <clears throat> it's a good point, Mr. George. When you remember <clears throat> when we had 58 indicators and we've narrowed that down to 18, 19, one of the things that we noticed in recalibrating those numbers is that we were not counting dual enrollment students, nor were we counting honor students in rigorous courses. So now that, that does represent mm -hmm. that. Okay. Matter of fact, we just met with the community college on this yesterday on how to increase the number of students in, in dual enrollment. And we'll be coming to you with uh, what we believe is a great opportunity for kids to be able to accelerate uh, their pathways. Well, just to piggyback on that real quick, um, dual enrollment are taking actual college classes, getting credit, but they don't get a weighted grade. AP gets a weighted grade even if they don't pass the test. So I, I feel that there's a great inequity in dual enrollment versus AP because in essence, a dual enrollment kid could never 
be valedictorian because they would never have the weighted grade. Mm -hmm. Yet they're actually getting the credit and actually taking yeah. the class. Yeah. So uh -huh. I would I would like to see somehow us if we are able I don't know if it's a state thing but able to give a weighted percentage to dual enrollment as well as AP. Yeah, thank Both you, thank you for that because be we did talk about that once before, and that is not a state decision. That is definitely something within our control, and and that does need to be revised. Yeah, they should be, be included the same. Mm -hmm, in a grading. Policy. Either way, four that needs to be revised this year. Did. I don't before care graduation. which way it goes. They need to be the same. Well, well, it Can we revise that well, before graduation? So the students have already started the school year, issue. so you don't want to go and make a change to grading in the middle of school the year. Mm -hmm. So we can work on revising the policy, okay. but we would be implementing it for the following year. So you don't want to go making changes to things mm. in, while you're in the middle of it. Okay. Yeah. That's just something I would really I st feel strongly about that needs to be changed. Absolutely. We agree. So, sorry, I didn't mean to go off topic. Uh, and thank you. Mr. George for bringing that up because I did forget to mention besides these assessment the dual enrollment does figure into college and career ready as well as uh, participation in our al advanced topics of algebra 2 course that uh, we have an agreement with Chesapeake College with and uh, there is also uh, a career assessment licensing assessment that students can take and also be considered uh, career college ready College and career ready. So that that takes the place of say the AP or I mean the uh, SAT test or something like that. It would not it would not replace it, but it would also it would designate them as college and career ready if they scored okay. the minimum score okay. on that. And Ms. Sally, I'll ask Ms. Sally to join us for this next section. Uh, we have an indicator for world languages. Uh, by the end of the 2021 school year, we'd like to see 60% of our seniors having completed three or more credits in the same world language. So we do track that data from year to year. Uh, it does fluctuate quite a bit from year to year. Uh, one thing when we're looking at this data, we are looking for three credits in the same world language. So. A student who completed two credits of French and two credits of Spanish would not show up in this data because they haven't completed three credits of the same world language. So it does eliminate some students who may be doing with two different languages. And I'm Julie Alley representing the World Languages and Media Office and nice to see you all today. And um, because I am just coming new to this in as of June, I really, we did not really have a lot of information as to what was affecting the fluctuation of, of this, but um, we would certainly like to see that data going higher with more students having completed three or more credits. So we are looking at some things that we might be able to do in order to make that increase or at least make us in a positive trend that you could see over the years. Um, having a student at Queen Anne's County High School, you know that world languages teachers are very hard to come by um, and to maintain and to keep. So that is, is something that is, we have a full staff this year, so we're hoping to maintain that. In looking at previous years, like I said, there did not seem to be a discernible pattern. Um, and I, I didn't have that information, so we're gonna start from here and, and move forward. We are piloting new texts for world languages, hopefully that will be more interactive and might encourage more students to participate. The second thing that we are trying to do is we are investigating, right now it takes two years for a student at the middle school level to earn a world language credit, high school credit, and we would like to perhaps use blended learning so that because it ends up being a scheduling issue at the middle school because that's where they have their unified arts block and it's on an A day, B day schedule. So we have some online learning classes that perhaps or resources that we could use on the off day when they are not in class. The students could do that kind of flipped classroom 
learning and then the next day reinforce it with the teacher but they would make more progress in the year rather than just doing it every other day so that is what we are investigating and looking into and I see some other suggestions too of consideration to expand world language programs at the elementary level and consideration to expand extended day opportunities in world languages what do we offer besides English, uh, Spanish, and French? We do, at this time, we do not offer any other languages. We do have a teacher in the county who is certified to teach German. So, again, it's looking at how we could make that equitable and right. scheduling. Did I see somewhere we had an out-of-county student come along that had sign language and his other system Mm -hmm. And we worked through that process. Yes, we had like an elementary school. Yeah, my was was that that children. children. Okay. Yeah, and she that's a possibility, but it wouldn't be possible for someone to come in with German or Japanese or Chinese because we just can't do we, that. We can't. We can't um, at this point. Makes sense. We can't. First of all find these teachers and hire them but that would be something that maybe in the future a we goal. are looking to yeah mm -hmm. do we have latin uh, uh, well we i was going to ask spanish that too and, just spanish and french would we consider polling parents and the community as to what next language they might like to see because there has been a lot of talk about latin i took three years of latin trust me i know all about it um that would be a good suggestion and we can look into that okay um, just to say, in my school system, we started Latin in like seventh or eighth grade. I was a year behind because I moved in the eighth grade. So I was in French in the northern part of the country. I couldn't take French in my junior high that I went to. I couldn't start Latin in the middle of the year. So I was basically a year behind in my languages. But um, Latin is a great foundation for all languages. Absolutely, especially. And I've heard a lot of people ask why we can't move towards that. I, like I said, I came in June. I don't know what the the history is yet of the world, the languages that we have offered. Um, but I'm certainly, as I get to know the world languages teachers and the program, uh, those are certainly questions that need to be answered. And look. Well, as a parent of a Queen Anne's County High School senior, mm -hmm. um, doing colleges, colleges are looking for three years. Mm -hmm. They are. So does that mean, once again, that these kids that are seniors now will not get those three credits to forward to the college Most if they're taking two languages? I do know that they have been counseled, the, the school counselors do counsel them if you are college bound right. that you would take three courses right and they encourage the students who are considering going to a higher education they that they would get them um you're i'm i would assume mine's you, had all mine's had yes. all uh spanish but i know of two children two children two young adults mm -hmm. that have had uh two french two. and have had spanish now, where are they? And I know both of them are going to higher education. So where are their transcripts going to be when they go, when they apply to their colleges? That's which most of them already have applied. Mm -hmm. I, mean, we, I know we have. So what, what happens when it's not showing that three years? Because the majority of colleges are looking for three years that is of in the same language. Did, did, let me just jump in here. That's so in, in the college completer, they need two at a minimum in yes. the college completer. That's but you're right. absolutely right. Colleges there there are, are many colleges three. are three. Yes. And I would venture to say there are many colleges now that are looking for four. If you look there in their engineering over, programs. Right. Right. And I think that's why, you know, as Julia represented here, that we need to really consider what all of our options are to be able to expand our language programs beyond Sp Spanish and, and French. And we're looking really into how we can offer it in an online platform because there are very few teachers, as you know, many language programs when you develop them will, will um, uh, I won't use the word cannibalism, but they'll sometimes uh, phase each other out, so to speak, because you have a limited number of teachers. So. The, the long-term vision here is to start younger, 
and start at an elementary level and be able to build a pipeline uh, offering such languages as Chinese as an example. Uh, so, and this also fits into our course pathway sequence that we really are taking a look at as well. <coughs> so, uh, I would venture to say I know uh, Dr. Kane has had extensive uh, experience as well in building language programs. Uh, it's something that we have talked about in the short term. How do we begin to start looking at, um, you know, we can start very simply in an after school program, which we've done many times uh, uh, as a place to start. Uh, summer programs to, to build interest, to be able to expand that where in some cases students could come out of middle school uh, and some of the experiences we've had, they come out of middle school with a, a level two under their belt. Yeah. So if, if they're there, then you, then you really have did. to build mine a language program grade. at so a high school one. level mm -hmm. because they'll, run, they'll, they'll end up running out of of, of options. Right, so right, right, right. it's more of a longer term vision. I'm just worried about to. the kids that, you know, not because I didn't understand that that's how this worked. That Is there any if, way that we could do like a summer online course? Like, you know, there's like, you know, that they could say, you know, between my junior and senior year, you could take this course in the summer. Original credit. Absolutely. And get your credit. And be and able to accelerate. Yeah. Right. With and we language. have, I've worked hard at getting, we have two language teachers, one French, one Spanish or who are fully qualified to deliver online. Oh, wow. Yeah. So uh, Pe Peggy Weiser at, and Gladys Rosario at Queen Anne's County High School. Yeah. So they've done a lot of work in working with credit recovery, but right. since we had, until this point, not been able to offer original credit online, I've always proposed that we do. Um, but this would be something that we could work on. Right. Plus it would be equitable to both, to both high schools. It would be something that could be given out they both to get everybody yeah. right yeah. right so right. and are they given any kind of waiver or credit to a student that does two years of Spanish and two years of French instead of the three-year gambit because this is kind of new but that three is, years of required that language. is something that is actually um, significant to I guess the schools themselves well it is it's a question that's answered by whoever is the liaison with higher education and at this time that used to be Tina Thomas mm -hmm. but I'm not sure who that is right now mm -hmm. um, but they do change those things and what mm -hmm. their requirements or what their goals are right and so, once that catches on our students will all know I got to do three years of this yes. or well, the, this yes. not two and two well, we have but a lot we of got kids, a gap I guess what my here question kids still is, is that middle. we have a lot of, well I'm not I'm not saying a lot I'm just telling you two that I know of mm -hmm. that have um, French and Spanish are we going to give them on their um, transcript credit that it shows that they've had three years, maybe not of the same language, but they've had three years? Well, that would always that's show on their transcript. That, that would always show on their transcript. That's, it, that's just, you know, um, because I don't know that colleges are being specific. They just want to see that they've had three years of a right. language. A language, not yeah. necessarily. They don't care the what language. language. Right. The other right. thing right. that we're looking at for inclusion on next year's um, I don't know, know why I forgot to mention this. On next year's program of study is we have um, quite a few EL students. Um, so we are looking to offer Spanish for native speakers because that will help to support their home literacy as well as their um, language Second acquisition. Language. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is something that um, we've gotten the SCED codes for that so that that can be added and that will help um, especially with scholarly um, conversations and things like that and how you would take apart a piece of writing so it will help them in their ELA classes as well as um, their language classes. Sorry. That's all right. No, that's very good. <laughs> Thank you. So we need to reach a goal at some point where we have teachers who can teach four years. Oh, so absolutely. That we, we do. Get ahead of well, that. Well, we do. We do. Because they've got some kids. They start. Here. They start in middle school. Mm -hmm. well, I started in middle school, seventh and eighth grade, and then he took one in tenth grade, and he's going to do his last one this year. Gotcha. Uh, that next uh, working period or next semester. So I mean, he'll have all three of his, mm -hmm. um, because we hadn't planned on doing any more Spanish. Right. But when we found out that the colleges were looking for that right. three years, right. that's why we decided to make sure we got another yeah. credit in and there. And see, when, when I went to school, we had a junior high. 
ninth grade was in the junior high. Mm -hmm. You didn't go to high school but 10th, 11th, and 12th. So 8th and ninth grade, you generally took your Latin. Mm -hmm. Then when you went to the high school, you took either French or right. Spanish. And right. you got your three years. Right. Not everybody did three years, but right. most did. I right. couldn't. I didn't get to start that process till right. a year later. So I did, well, I actually did three years of Latin. In the same year, my third year of Latin was my first year of Spanish, but I got fed up with it and dropped, I talked to my mother. Well, we, we wouldn't have known it had we not applied to exactly. a college that was looking exactly. for three years. I did not years. know this was a new requirement. We applied to so a college that was looking for three years. That needs years to and, be, so. um, we got to get, another, guidance well, now they're we got to get that other uh, semester of it. So. Now they're telling they are. Really I would they do they the are. ninth grade orientation, and they actually said it. It cannot be right. Okay. I mean, they're telling people mm -hmm. you need it. I mean, it's out there. It's in the colleges. There's different requirements They're for colleges so. if you want to play D1 sports or D2 or D3 mm -hmm. sports, too. Mm -hmm. So what is the ultimate thing we have to make sure everybody's educated on? Gotcha. We have gotcha. To provide that. Well, so, but thank you, because you have been only on the job since June, so. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thank questions you. for, for Ms. Allie? Yes, they're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on to government. I'll ask Mr. Tully to come join us while I talk a little bit about the data. Uh, <coughs> government HSA is another graduation requirement, similar to Algebra 1 and English 10. Uh, we have been doing the government HSA, I believe, since 2012-13 when it came back after it went away for a couple years. Uh, our goal originally was 90% of our, our first-time test takers would be score proficient on it, but 14-15 school year, we came just a hair below that 90%, so we decided we were going to push it up to 95%. So our goal now for, for government HSA is 95%. And we're just not quite getting up to that level yet, but, but we're, we're still working very hard on that. Uh, and again, you can see the data is kind of flatlined the last two years. Uh, if we look at trend data and, and subgroup data, trend data, uh, we did make some progress with the African American population in the past two years. We, we reduced that gap a little bit there. Uh, the other groups that we're concerned about kind of got a little bit bigger. But it's still <coughs> very good data for, for a, a state required assessment. Again, this is first time test takers we look at, so it doesn't include any retakes of the assessment in that data. Mr. Right. Tolley? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adam Tolley, Supervisor of Social Studies and CTE, and I just want to Formally, uh, thank you all for allowing me to join the, the team here at Queen Anne's. It's been a wonderful transition. Dr. Kane, Mr. Paluski, the whole CNI team, HR just welcomed me, embraced me, and uh, they told me I would hit the ground running, and I did, and I haven't stopped yet, so, and I don't, don't uh, plan on it. So, um, obviously, I don't have some of the slides that, that the other contents do because um, being new and just working on and figuring out what, um, what is working and um, you know, what we need to do in the future, and I've done some of that so far, meeting with um, the teachers and just getting their overview on how things have worked and what they see needs are. <clears throat> so we're going to continue that uh, all year, and I've already, you know, gathered a, a cadre of teachers who are going to work this summer to look at curriculum, and we're going to, you know, do a, do an overview of, of the tests and, and the curriculum itself just to see, you know, where we are and what we need to do to, um, you know, make this data go up. As Mr. Brown mentioned, um, you know, we did see a, a slight decrease in, in overall performance, um, about 2%. Um, you know, however, we did see an increase in the African American subgroup, which is, which is wonderful. Um, and then again, a decrease in English learners and the special education um, subgroup, which we're going to, to look at this year as well. Um, just as far as changes go for the government test, the government HSA is changing vendors this year as far as um, who is administering the test. And I believe it's is it iTester who is, who is changing mm -hmm. over. Even though they're changing vendors, they are not changing the actual the actual content of the test, the structure of the test will change a little bit in order to make it a little bit shorter to, to have it fit into a class period um, <coughs> so it's a little more chunked out, a little more manageable. Um, and, and that's pretty much as, as far as the government goes. The state has talked about adding a uh, assessment in for eighth grade, which is basically the U.S. History Part 1, um, and I think that they were planning on pushing it out 
soon, but I, they've hit a couple snags. Uh, and my first state social studies briefing next week on the 26th. So after that, I'll have some more information, you know, to see um, to see where they are and see where it goes from there. Questions for Mr. Tully? Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Thank, nice you. Nice Thank you. Thank you. Yes, nice to meet you all as well. I appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to move on into biology. I'm going to ask Mr. Page to come join us. Uh, you can see the <coughs> biology test scores uh, for the past two years. And we actually had some good, good results on the biology test scores this year, uh, both as at our all student group as well as in many of our subgroups. Uh, this is one that, that if you asked me about last year, I would say that you're gonna, you, we would have seen these scores drop and drop drastically. Biology is on its way out. The, the, the HSA biology last administration was last year. We will be switching to a new test, and, and Mr. Page will tell us a little bit about that. But since it was phasing out last year, last year was a participation requirement. Students had to participate in order to meet the graduation requirement. They did not have to meet a minimum score. Usually when that happens, we see scores drop because students know they don't need to meet a minimum score. We didn't see that in biology. We actually saw scores increase. Well, that uh, says something about our kids, doesn't it? Yep, and our teachers. And our teachers, for mm -hmm. sure. But yeah. So that, that, that I was pleasantly surprised at that. Mr. Page. Board members, executive team, good afternoon. Um, so I'm, I am also very pleased with the scores. Our, I, I can say that our teachers are doing an extremely uh, awesome job with uh, the instruction and uh, uh, working with our students. Um, some of the things that we are uh, that are working, we have uh, currently over the past year we've adopted uh, new K to five curriculum. We adopted the HMH Science Dimension Program, um, and we will be. I will be working with each of the teachers and each of the schools throughout this this opening month. Uh, to make sure that they're all on board and they all have the materials of instructions that they need uh, in order to get going. We also adopted a new biology text and uh, we'll be working with the teachers to get them in for a little bit more additional PD on that. Uh, we had them in for two days uh, within the month of July to kind of go over that. So they have, uh, they've had plenty of training on it but we're going to continue that training to make sure that they're still up to speed with all of that. Uh, the, the other two, three that we, uh, I'm sorry, the other two that we adopted, we adopted an <coughs> uh, advanced placement physics and an advanced placement environmental science text. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, new assessments, uh, as Dave had mentioned, the uh, new assessments uh, are structured very differently. So I've been to the development of those assessments at the state level. I've also had uh, probably in the order of 10 teachers attend those and I appreciate uh, you know Mr. Paluski uh, and Dr. King giving us permission to do that because I think that's vital for our teachers to go to those trainings where they learn the platform of the uh, and they they review the content so with that said they've brought that material back and over the summer we've developed modules uh, and those modules are testing modules that would help the students understand how how the flow of the test works, the content of the test, and so on. Um, we also partnered with the Eastern Shore Nine, so all the counties were able to get uh, two, t two teachers from specific uh, grade levels, and we were, were able to develop uh, modules for each standard. And by the end of this year, all those modules will be up and running so that we can give them to our teachers and they can use those as uh, assess assessments within their classroom. So we worked with gr grades three to five. That's the one test at grade five then six to eight and then we're working with our high school well that will be what is to come is really working on the high school in terms of their uh, assessments that match the Maryland integrated size assessment uh, lastly uh, we had the K to five teachers and we had uh, the biology teachers in to rewrite their curriculum guides and and other teachers that were able to attend like our AP physics teachers um, they came in and they worked extremely hard to get those up and running we had brand new documents and uh, all the teachers were, all those, all those grade levels were able to get out uh, the curriculum guides before the before school started, and um, you know we've already seen some, uh, seen some 
uh, collaboration going on with those and teachers are really thankful that we have those uh, now that we can we can work with them. Uh, next slide is um, what we're still working on. So in our transition, we're, st we're still working on uh, middle school. So right now we're, we are piloting uh, grades six, seven, and eight, which is the earth and space science, the life science, and physical science curriculum. So we have those, uh, th our pilot actually starts in October. We're piloting three different platforms for that. Uh, and um, we're, we're gonna be piloting two others as we go throughout the, out the year. Um, and we'll also be looking at an advanced placement chemistry text. And then uh, lastly, I'd just like to touch on that uh, this particular year for grades um, five and eight, grades five and eight, they will be in the piloting stage for the MISA or the Maryland Integrated Science Assessment. Uh, so uh, grades five and eight, we had the field test last year. We got all the data, um, well, we, the state got all the information. Now they're pushing out a pilot test. We'll be taking the pilot test this year. Uh, in three, I'm sorry, grades five and eight. And then in high school, this is the first year, as Dave had mentioned, the high school test is now uh, no longer the HSA, it is now the MISA. So this year is the first year that we'll be, uh, we'll be testing using the MISA. Again, that's a field test, and we really won't get any information back in terms of what that, uh, how our students perform and so on. And um, in terms of high school, that is, uh, Right, correct. It will be a participation, uh, uh, a grade on for the for the students. But why did they change? What is the significance of the change? The significance is the change in the standards. Oh, okay. So okay. we we have uh, right. we have moved to the next generation science standards, <coughs> and in order for us to accommodate that change, we needed to uh, adapt and change our our assessment to meet meet those requirements. Another additional change is the biology test was based on a second <coughs> course. On a what? A single course. It was based an end of the year course for biology. The MISA is based on a series of classes or courses. That's what I was going to ask. Is it required? So, so last, so prior, we were just assessing students on their knowledge of life science. Now we're assessing students on their knowledge of earth and space science, life science, and physical science. There's three domains that we'll be assessing the students on. But the high school test is a combination of all that? Yes, so correct. It's so it's not a... Limited from sixth grade, huh? Well, it, it's based, based... It's a vertically articulated... Um, they're vertically articulated standards, so we they are built. So what you learn in third grade builds in... I'm just making this... Oh, you know, okay. Builds in fifth grade and then builds in seventh and then builds in, you know, maybe... More like math. Both guns. Right. So there are skills, and they build upon those skills of understanding. And biology no longer stands on its own <coughs> as a subject, but is inclusive in some of the teachings along the way. It will still be a biology course. course. Okay. Okay. We'll, we will still have a biology course, yes. but assessment. it will be part of the MISA assessment. Gotcha. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Any other Science related questions? Thank you. Very good. Thank okay, you. moving on. Uh, rigorous coursework. We, we do have a uh, indicator for rigorous coursework. Actually, a couple of indicators for rigorous coursework. Uh, and again, this goes right into the discussion we, we had earlier about uh, dual enrollment and a versus AP courses and that. These indicators do look at both dual en enrollment and AP courses, as well as honors courses. So the first one is 75% of our seniors will have completed at least one AP honors course or dual en AP honors or dual enrollment course uh, while they're in high school. And uh, we've looked at that for two years now. We've had growth in uh, as a system, and we're up now to 74.2% of our seniors have participated in one of those three types of courses uh, and has grown in all cases except for the african-american population again uh, so so we need to do some work to get those students into some of these more rigorous courses and programs uh, very similar to that is our indicator for uh, percentage of students who score three or better on an ap exam 
or earn a college credit while in high school. So this would also be your dual enrollment students as well as your AP students. Uh, and we're tracking that. And again, very similar data. Uh, we've gone up uh, system-wide. We're at 44.8%. Our goal's at 40%. But we still have lost some of the African-American population. It actually dropped uh, about 1% from the previous year. So again, we need to get some people in these courses. And then this, this isn't actually an academic indicator, uh, but something we do track closely, and that is participation in the AP tests. Uh, last year, 2017, we had more students take more tests than, than, than any previous year. And we had more of those students scoring a three or better than we've had in any previous year. So while on this next slide, as you look at this data, we actually had a couple years where we had a higher percentage of three or better on the AP exams. Because of the number of students, we actually did much better last year. Uh, last year, we had a total of 591 students that got credit through AP coursework or through AP exams. As opposed to 13, 14, there was only 493 that year, even though it was a higher percentage. So our kids are doing great work in AP. Any, any when is the AP test taken this year, for this year, for the seniors this year? Okay. It's in May. That's the second, first. I May. Think it's May. the second week of May this okay. year. It's, it's a little different schedule. Just so, than in case last Monfrey year. gets to tell me. <laughs> oh. We do have it on the Just calendar. call. We'll make, we'll Just make call sure you got all the information. Yeah, I'll make need. sure I write it down in my book. <laughs> and he'll ask you if you have a need to keep an eye on it. That's what my It's usually in the first two weeks of May. I think it's actually a week later. This okay. Year. <laughs> other, other questions on any of that data? If not, I hope you will remember that great things are happening in Queen Anne's County Public Schools. <laughs> Dave, are we doing prep courses for all of these tests? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not a fan of tests and <laughs> that just, just drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> we not direct test prep courses. We offer support I, in preparation. We tests. may have, uh, there may be an SAT course. Ken Island, I'm not 100% on it. Yep. Both schools have it. Right. Both schools, Both schools have, have it? it. Okay. The SAT prep. But I, I think that's the only thing that I would call a yeah. prep course. It's because a lot of these assessments are based on current course work. So right. the biology test is after the biology course. Uh, Park is directly related to what the kids are learning in, in classes. We need to start pushing the ACT test. Too. Yes, because that's getting real demanded. A lot of colleges are looking at the ACT. Yeah, they are really looking at it. It's funny. This has daughter, been a different year for me, I'll tell you. In the ACT oh, different the summer. SAT. Well, we did the SAT, but then we were told she not to do any more SATs to the ACT. Well, yeah, well, she did so. Both twice, mm -hmm. but. So thank, thank you, you Mr. Very Brown. Much. Thank you, Mr. Brown. If, if I can just add, uh, as, as Mr. Brown um, concludes, uh, how proud I am of this school system. Uh, I really want to acknowledge all of our uh, curriculum instruction supervisors. It is, it is an honor to be around these professionals. Uh, they teach me so much. And I will tell you that they're the true engine of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. As you know, uh, they don't just supervise one area. Uh, and I don't think the public really understands that. They supervise in sometimes three to four different content areas. And to be an expert in four to five content areas and meet the needs of the schools, and they're so responsive to the schools. And I couldn't be more proud of the work, and I think you'll see that. And, and the data is just one indicator that we're moving in the right direction, but I think there's a lot of things that are at play that tell us that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we've narrowed our indicators. I mentioned that before. We had 58. We've narrowed that focus down to 18. Uh, we've aligned it with our school improvement plan. We've had the audit. I, I think you'll, you've heard from each one of them all the work that's going on in curriculum to be able to align. We know that was a gap. Uh, that, that comes because of their leadership. And uh, 
I just kudos to them and, and all the work that they do. They never get enough recognition uh, for the work that they do day in and day out. Uh, our school system wouldn't be where it is without these people. And their teachers speak so highly of the support that they get from them. And so kudos to them and the entire curriculum instruction team. We're headed in the right direction. Absolutely. And just one more comment behind you, uh, Mr. Paluski. And yes, absolutely, our illustrious CNI team, well done. I am going to propose one more challenge for you because <laughs> you are so outstanding at what you do. We really, really show um, outstanding evidence of the work that is done for students on behalf of teachers as well as supervisors and all those in CNI. But we also want to look at those gap groups. And my challenge to you is to find ways, whether we're talking about culturally relevant instruction, whether we're talking about different ways to group our students, but to find ways to reach every single one of our students, whether it's our special education group, our African American group, our English language learners, so that they can also, also, show that same level of improvement in their academics because remember what we're about we're about reaching every single one of our students so my challenge to you is to work on that work on that with teachers we'll get the word out to parents in our community and how we can all pull together because it's not just your role right because all of us do it but we'll work together to make it happen for every single one of our students thank you for what you do Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, is there any other business? If there's no other business before this board, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The ayes have it. Thank you.